Hey there, intro to Anatomy and Physiology. Today we are going over your review right before your test. Your test is tomorrow, Wednesday, May 6th. Um, and so this video may be a wee bit longer because I want to go through the entire study guide, recap what you need to know for your test, um, and so forth. The only thing in your packet that we won't fill out is the crossword puzzle. That's just an optional way to practice the vocab. I don't give any points for your study guide packet while we're not at school and um, the crossword puzzle is optional. And then the concept map I won't do today because I will make a video to go over that on Wednesday. I recommend you watch that video right before you take your test on Wednesday. So um, you want to take your test tomorrow before 5 p.m. Um, I will not be available after 5 p.m. to help you if you have run into any technical issues. Um, and you need to access your test through your email. I'm going to email each of you guys in a unique link for your test only. Um, and this allows me to set a timer on it. So you have 60 minutes. Our normal class time is 45 or less. And um, 60 minutes should give you guys plenty of time uh, to get it done. All right. So I'm basically going to go through our study guide um, with you guys for the most part in order, except for this part. Because if you recall, at the very beginning of this unit, we started at the very back of our study guide and we drew this little, actually, this one's a little bit better. Um, we kind of drew a sort of chart on the back side. So that's what this slide is recapping. Um, so to review, and this is on the test, um, your nervous system has three main functions. It learns about the world around you, senses what's going on. You decide how you're going to react and behave and what you're going to do with that information. And then you have the motor response. And so your muscles and glands are effectors and your motor response responds to that. So this little diagram, you see a glass of water, your brain says, ah, oh, I'm thirsty, I would like to drink that water. So then your brain tells your muscles to grab the water and for you to drink it. Um, that's it, that's all your nervous system does is just those three things. And the only things you actually control are effectors, which are your muscles and glands. Important stuff to know for your test. Um, this flow chart or a similar flow, flow chart will be also on the test. Um, so we'll actually kind of go over this actually on one of the other flow charts in a bit um, for you, but this is good information for you guys to know. So I'll go into this in a little bit more detail though later, so that's why I'm skipping over it. This picture is on your test. You'll see it on your review. When you take the review, I think there's only one or two questions associated with this picture. You should know what all of these things that are being identified are. I think one of the early assignments like um, assignment two maybe or assignment three, how do you identify these parts? That would be a great one to go back and practice to prepare. Um, but make sure you know what all of these different things are pointing to and what their names are. On that same page, by the way, I didn't mention this, we are on the front packet, page one, okay, of your study guide here, kind of going in order. Um, on, along the same notes, we have our different types of neurons. You will see this on the review, you will also see it on the test as well. Um, identifying them, right, as multipolar, right, because we've got lots of dendrites coming off of this guy, um, bipolar, and then the unipolar ones, right, are a little unique but also knowing where you find these guys in the body. So our multipolar neurons are used um, as interneurons or our efferent neurons. Bipolar is just really used as sensory neurons in the eyes and the nose. And unipolar are our main sensory or afferent neurons that are sort of coming back to our body. The functional um, unit of each of these is multipolar units are both motor and inner neurons, it's not a typo, it is meant to say one here because they are a type of inner neuron. And then unipolar neurons are our sensory neurons. We'll see a diagram that shows that in more detail here in a bit. All right, flipping in your packet here to page two. You do need to know not the pictures, but their functions of these different 
neuroglia cells, neuroglia. Um, these are the cells that are, along with the neurons, part of the nervous system. These are all the support cells that help out your nervous system to function properly. So your astrocytes, okay, they are what form your blood-brain barrier. Um, they basically protect your neurons and make sure that harmful things aren't going into your neurons. You have the microglia cells. These are phagocytic, meaning they eat other things. Epididymal cells, sorry, my little screen is blocking this off a little bit, but you have, um, they circulate cerebral spinal fluid. And from our last lesson, cerebral spinal fluid is found in a lot of places of your central nervous system. So surrounding the brain in that subarachnoid space, it's in the central canal of your spinal cord, it's um, in all the ventricles, your lateral ventricle, third ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, all of those have cerebral spinal fluid. Now, epididymal cells are what circulate those cells um, or that fluid, excuse me, throughout the body. Now, the choroid plexus is what makes the um, epididymal cell. And that's what you can't see on my picture that's a little cut off down below. Okay, then you have oligodendrocytes, my favorite one, oligodendrocytes. That's why it's got an exclamation point. I think it's fun to say. Um, this is basically like the Schwann cell, but only in my central nervous system. So these four right here are in the central nervous system, meaning brain okay, and spinal cord. So these guys, my satellite and Schwann cells, they are found on my nerves that are in my peripheral nervous system. So those nerves that extend out from my spinal cord, basically nerves. Um, and so the Schwann cells make myelin, like the oligodendrocytes make myelin, and then the satellite cells um, sort of protect the outside of those cell bodies, similar to kind of like what our astrocytes do for us. All right, hi. Um, so here is kind of where this is the next page page three no excuse me i've got a little different order here um this guy is on page oh no it's there i'm sorry page two still um this is where those different types of neurons from page one come into play so um when i was talking about my unipolar neurons being part of the sensory system. Watch this arrow right here. This is sending signals in to my spinal cord through my sensory unipolar neurons. Um, that's why they are part of the sensory tract of my nervous system. My interneurons, they communicate between the two um, in this reflex arc here. And so they're called interneurons, but that's a type of multipolar neuron. And then another type of multipolar neurons are ones that are the motor ones that send the signal out, notice the arrow, sending the signal out of the spinal cord towards my effectors, my muscles or glands that need to be affected. So here's a little snippet of the um, spinal cord as well. Uh, just as a reminder, gray matter and white matter. What makes something white is myelin. So when something is myelinated, it has, it kind of looks white. So the um, areas in here that are gray matter are places on the neuron that do not have myelin. So if you look here, it's basically the nucleus and the dendrites of our multipolar neurons are in here. And then the axon terminals, okay? those are on the gray matter because they are not myelinated. And remember, the benefit of being myelinated is it speeds up your chemical reactions. All right, we're cruising on through here. Um, a picture similar to this, but one you've seen on your homework assignment, will be on the test asking you what the lobes of the brain are um, and then what some of these regions are. What do they control and what do they do for your body? Uh, let's see, just as a little reminder for you, um, Broca's area is your ability to speak, whereas Wernicke's area is how you understand speech. So if I could understand what someone's saying, but I lost the ability to 
actually form with my lips and my mouth the words I want to say, I probably have an issue in my frontal lobe, okay, somewhere over here, right around my Broca's area. Um, and so this is the part of that motor cortex that controls my motor movements of my mouth, my tongue and my lips, um, to be specific. All right, so different parts of our cerebrum control different things. Our visual cortex is in the back on the occipital lobe. Um, and so we've recently gone over all of these. Um, make sure you know the three parts of the brain stem and what each of those do. And very important, the cerebellum is your balance. Okay, it's the part of your body that controls your balance and sort of coordination. All right, all right. Um, next up in your packet on page, where are we at by now? Page four is this picture, your last set of notes. Um, just finished filling this entire thing out. So I added in each letter and what they're kind of represented on here. We color coded the three main sections of our brain. Our brain is broken up into the cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and diencephalon. Um, and you can go through each of these and look at specifically what you find in each section. Um, and then we also talked about the meninges that cover the brain and color coded those um, and the different functions of all of those um, other internal structures. And that was just yesterday's lecture. So hopefully this stuff is still pretty fresh for you. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, we've already labeled and gone over these, the structures of our um, brain, the meninges. We colored them on the previous page, and I also um, suggested that you color this picture if it's black and white on your paper. Uh, but these are protective structures, remember. To protect our brain, but also to protect our spinal cord, we just have basically the skin of our scalp, which isn't super protective, but right underneath that, our skull bones which are, um, and then the meninges add an extra protective layer, as well as that cerebral spinal fluid. So we have on here, it's important you remember, it goes from outermost to innermost, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. Pia sits on the brain itself, okay? Um, and underneath the arachnoid mater is where we have our subarachnoid space. You find um, uh, CSF in there, cerebral spinal fluid, flowing in this section where all the little spider web stuff is. Okay. It's important structure. All right, I feel like this is the most complex piece of the um, unit. You do not have to identify this on a picture. Um, here's the important things for you guys to remember. When one neuron wants to communicate with another, we call that junction the synaptic cleft, okay, this area where they come together. They don't actually touch, they just get really, really close. When we want to send a signal, okay, and one signal is being sent to another one, um, what that is is called an action potential. So another word for a nerve impulse is an action potential. You can see that at number one, okay, here, um, number four is kind of showing you with that arrow uh, what's happening there. And then what gets released to signal the next neuron um, what to do and what's coming next is um, the release of a neurotransmitter. So we have a release of a neurotransmitter, and that's what signals next. Okay? So an action potential is just a fancy word for a nerve impulse, so like the little zap that sends the signal. Okay? And what signals the next neuron is a neurotransmitter, much like acetylcholine was the neurotransmitter for our muscles, very, very similar in our nervous system. But there's different ones. There's like dopamine and other ones that are controlling happiness, serotonin, other things that are neurotransmitters. Um, there's a wide variety, but that's it in a brief nutshell. Okay, um, Not much that you need to know here on this page, but we did get this little section labeled too. All right, <clears throat> this picture makes sense to kind of go along with the previous one, but this is very similar to our other picture of our spinal cord. But it's here just to show you these different sections of how signals are coming in and out of our spinal cord. 
especially if we're talking about a reflex. So what happens first here, a pin pierces the skin, there's receptors, pain receptors in our skin that will send the signal to the spinal cord because we wanna pull our hand back from that painful stimulus. So that's kind of our first part of our reflex. So it, the signal gets sent this away from our sensory afferent um, unipolar neuron because it's got this little bulge right here in that dorsal root ganglion. There is the interneuron that connects the two and sends the signal back out to my motor or efferent pathway. And it is going to have an effect, efferent, think effect, it's gonna affect an effector, my muscle or my gland, excuse me. Um, and I will stimulate, stimulate my muscle to pull back so whatever painful thing is no longer hurting. All right, that's just kind of very, very similar to the other picture. Um, and again, we've got our white and gray matter um, picture here. Now, just below this, we have a more detailed label of the parts of our spinal cord. One thing important to note, you will see a picture similar to this on the test, is the three layers of my meninges, just like on the brain, outermost to innermost, think DAP, dura, arachnoid, pia. DAP, the AP, okay? Um, we have the central canal. You find CSF in that little canal. It connects um, to the ventricles of the brain. We have our white and our gray matter, of course. And then our ventral root and our dorsal root. You don't have to identify those on the test, but your dorsal root ganglion is a little bit thicker, remember, because the cell bodies of my multipolar neurons are found in here, and so that's what makes a little swelling Section is because those neurons coming into the spinal cord have a different anatomical feature than those leaving um, the spinal cord because these ones coming out are motor neurons and these guys coming in are unipolar uh, sensory neurons. Okay, now right next to this picture, we haven't labeled this guy yet. Don't worry guys, I didn't forget. So um, when we are talking about what is a nerve, Okay, we, we know a neuron is a single teeny tiny guy. A nerve is a bundle of these. Just like in the skeletal unit, when we talked about like a muscle fiber was an individual cell, but then we bundled a bunch of them together to make a muscle, your nerves are kind of the same. So when we talk about like, I don't know, your brachial plexus nerve, you don't have to know that for the test, but it goes and it controls a lot of your arm. So what a nerve is, is a bunch of neuron axons, so just the skinny long part, all bundled together. So you can see that picture here. And I think on the next page, I got this a little bit bigger for us. All right, so what we see right here, notice that little kind of bluish um, insulation, that's the myelin covering my axon of whatever nerve it is, okay? So let's say it's a motor neuron coming out of my spinal cord going to a muscle. That myelin sheath, okay, is covering up those axons. So you can see that there's a whole bunch of them here all bundled together. So we have different layers wrapping and wrapping and wrapping them. And these words should look familiar. They're the same as the muscular system. So the ones that wrapping my individual axons are called the endoneurium because they're the clo closest to the inside. My perineurium bundles a whole group of them or a fascicle, same word as muscular. And then what bundles a whole bundle is called the epineurium. And so I've got multiple groups here of these little bundles going on here, all wrapped up in my epineurium. So, um, this little guy here um, is a fascicle, and those guys are blood vessels. This picture is not on your test, um, but just know we don't spend a lot of time on the peripheral nervous system here in this unit, but um, this is essentially what forms a nerve, and there's layers to it, much like our muscular system. All right, that's it for page six. So in your packet, the next page is this. This is the concept map. I will go over tomorrow. So we're gonna leave this one blank. It's a great way for us to review right before your test and kind of short and sweet, we go over everything, okay? Um, again, your crossword puzzle, 
not required. Uh, some words you maybe haven't gone over on here. I don't know off the top of my head, but many of them you might be able to define and that would just be great practice, not required and not necessary. Okay, um, now we're getting to page nine. This is a section we haven't filled out before. I was saving it for now because um, I wanted to review. And so this is essentially almost the same material that's on the back of your packet where we did the little flow chart. Let's see, you can see that kind of really blue on my screen um, <clears throat> where we had that flow chart on the very back, but just kind of showing you it in another way just to review. So when we talk about how the nervous system is organized, it is structurally organized based on if it's the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, remember, is just my brain and spinal cord, nothing else. Everything in the brain though, right? All the parts and then all the parts of the spinal cord. My peripheral nervous system is everything coming off of, right? Going to my fingers and my toes and my guts and everything branching off of my um, spinal cord. Now, when we refer to things being sent out and in from my um, peripheral nervous system, it gets organized into what we call the functional organization, and that's what these branches down here are representing. Right? Not, not like an actual organ, but their job or their role. So my peripheral nervous system is broken up to being either those things that are sensory, so sending information to my nervous system, my central nervous system, so the afferent pathway, or they are motor, sending a signal out to do something. They have an effect on an effector, a muscle or a gland. Um, the sensory is just that, right? Nothing new, fancy about that. But the motor, the things that I can control, some things I can control automatically, some things I can control um, consciously, right? So we divide that into my somatic and my autonomic nervous system. So as I'm speaking right now, I am consciously aware of the words and the way I'm forming my mouth and me touching my face, probably way more than I should. Um, that's somatic. Autonomic is the things I'm not thinking about. I'm not thinking about my heart rate and breathing. Um, I'm not thinking about maintaining my blood pressure. All of those things are automatic things that my body is doing and responding to. And then finally, those automatic things get broken down into two other sections. Um, if I'm at rest or if I am stressed. If I am stressed, my sympathetic nervous system will kick in. That's the fight or flight. So, you know, I'm anxious maybe about the test, right? Or I was crossing the street and a car almost hit me and my heart is racing and my hands get clammy and I feel like my eyes are dilated and all these things are occurring. Um, my body is in a fight or flight mode. All of those automatic things I don't have control over are part of this involuntary nervous system. Hopefully, most of the time you are living in your parasympathetic nervous system, and we phrase this as rest and digest. This is your body at ease, when it's relaxed, when it's non-stressed. Penny over here is showing our parasympathetic nervous system, just snoozing and snoring away behind me. Um, and she doesn't seem stressed at all. All right, and so the reason they say digest on this is because like your digestive processes happen normally when you are in your parasympathetic division. If you're stressed, your gut stuff kind of slows down or stops, so it's harder to digest food um, if you are stressed by whatever it could be. Maybe a lion's chasing you, or maybe you're just stressed about, um, you know, your anatomy test tomorrow. Okay, so this is how we organize our nervous system. And then the functions of the nervous system, I reviewed with that already, right? Here's that little picture again. So the S stands for our, I should move my little screen here. Um, this right here, the S stands for the sensory, right? The I stands for deciding what I'm gonna do when I see that glass of water, my integration. And then the actual action I take once that decision's been met is my motor, my um, functionality of my nervous system. And again, the only thing my motor system can control 
our muscles and glands. All right, so that's new notes for us that we just filled out. And then this big daddy, um, it's so tiny that I broke, I chopped the pictures up into two sections. So we'll go over the next one here, a little more zoomed in so you can see everything a little bit better. Um, so we're just looking at, still on page nine, I have that graphic number two on nervous tissue. So we already reviewed these guys, but our supporting cells of our nervous system are called the neuroglia, or sometimes shortened to glial cells, neuroglia. And they're broken up depending on where we find them. Some are found in the central nervous system and some in the peripheral. So in our central nervous system, our astrocytes, that was these guys, they form the blood-brain barrier. We have the microglia cells, that was these guys. Um, they are phagocytic, so if you had meningitis, which is a bacteria infection of the meninges of your brain. By the way, when you go to college, get your meningitis vaccines. I'm not kidding, it's a series, I think, of three shots. Some of you maybe have already started getting them now. Get your meningitis vaccines because what happens with meningitis, it gets spread in close quarters like dorms to young people. You think you have the flu, you have flu-like symptoms, and if it progresses, your brain gets infected with bacteria and you go into a coma. You don't normally wake up once you go into a coma. It's very difficult to treat. It's bacteria in your brain. And so get your meningitis shots, okay? That's for you guys going to college. Now, the microglia cells, their job is to fight something like meningitis. Okay. And so hopefully they would fight off an infection because they are phagocytic. Okay. They eat, they eat and engulf harmful things in your central nervous system. The next one are the epididymal cells. These guys are the ones that circulate your CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Oligodendrocytes, my favorite ones of all. They make the myelin that surrounds those neurons in my central nervous system. So Again, myelin looks white. So whenever we look at the um, cerebral cortex and we look at white matter and gray matter, oligodendrocytes are gonna be in the area of the brain where we have white matter, um, kind of in the more in the center, the gray matter tends to be on the outside in our brain at least. All right, so these guys are just in the central nervous system, but in my nerves, okay, I have two other specialized cells. Those are my satellite and Schwann cells. They're both pictured here, right? The satellite swells um, protect that cell body of the neuron and the Schwann cells, um, basically we know they make the myelin that helps speed up the chemical signals in my neurons. Make sure you know what four belong in the central nervous system and what two belong in the peripheral nervous system. I do believe that's on your test. Okay, now moving to the other branch of this picture here, Let's see. <clears throat> so first off, we had our supporting cells that make up our nervous tissue. The other cells are the neurons themselves. The neurons have a little bit more complicated structure. So we're going to go through um, the structure, terminology, and classification of them on this page. So first of all, a neuron can be broken up kind of in two main sections, the cell body and the processes. So here's the cell body right here. Okay? Um, sometimes referred to as the soma, and then the processes would be these little guys sticking off here, my dendrites, as well as my axon. This whole long thing is another process. So that's how this is getting broken down into my cell body and my processes. So let's focus on the cell body for now. The first one, you don't have to know, but if you love filling out everything, it's called the metabolic center, meaning this is where all of the day-to-day -day work of the cell is. So you've got mitochondria, right? They're gonna do making proteins and all those things your cells need to live. Uh, the nucleus, okay, we know that's very important where our DNA is found. And then the nissel substance is just rough ER um, in the body. It's not super important, you know that for the test though. Okay, they're just other organelles, okay? Those are all the organelles in our cell body basically. So my processes, as I've already mentioned, we've got my axons, this whole guy here, and then the dendrites, these little guys on the outside of my neuron. So 
on the axon itself, um, I have kind of this neck region. It's called the axon hillock. Um, collateral branches are just a, another neuron merges with yours if it branches. The myelin sheath, this is important, maybe highlight, underline, whatever. The myelin sheath speeds up your action potentials, those chemical signals. You can uh, send a signal much faster in a myelinated axon than you can an unmyelinated. They speed up reactions. So thanks to the Schwann cells that produce the myelin. Okay. Um, and there's these little nodes in between. One of the videos I showed you talked about how the signal kind of skips and it speeds up that way. Not important, you know all those details for the test. The nodes of Ranvir, that's where the signal skips between those little gaps in between each Schwann cell. And then at the very end, the tip here is the axon terminal. That's what would meet up with a nearby cell dendrite and the um, synaptic cleft would be there, the neural, the junction between my two neurons. All right. So dendrites, notice the arrows again on your, your picture here. Um, the arrows are showing you what direction the signal's going. So the signal always comes in the dendrites and then out and down along the axon. Always that direction. In on the dendrites, out on the axon. Okay. All right. Moving on to terminology for my uh, CNS and PNS. Okay. So this picture here will be helpful in going over some of this. So first off, okay, when we're talking about neurons in my central nervous system, right here, my spinal cord or my brain, um, wherever there are clusters of cells, bodies, okay, so like this right here, okay, that and this right here, that's a cell body, <clears throat> that is unmyelinated. So notice the part of the little butterfly shape those cell bodies are in. That is gray matter. Gray matter is when it's unmyelinated. I don't have that written on here, but you might add that. Gray matter is unmyelinated. Gray matter is unmyelinated. Okay. Now, our tracks in our central nervous system, these are parts that are like, like the corpus callosum, for example, that's like connecting the two halves. We call those tracks. The pons, they have tracks through it, like a brain stem is sending signals up. So basically the parts of the brain that are connecting to each other, we call them tracks and they have fibers. And those fibers are made up of white matter. White matter is myelinated, myelinated. So white matter is myelinated, gray matter is unmyelinated. Important distinction. All right. And then also in our peripheral nervous system, we have clusters of cell bodies over here. Where that cell body is, you see a swelling of the nerve, and we call that little cluster a ganglion. So our dorsal root ganglion is where the cell body is, the nucleus of our neuron. And then we also have just the nerve fibers, and we just labeled our picture of our nerve. Um, it's just the long axons getting sent out. All right. Now, um, let's see, on to our classification of the neurons. So this picture still applies up here, right? So when we're talking about this, right, those sensory neurons, notice the arrow here, is coming into the spinal cord. That's my sensory um, or afferent root, okay, coming in. My interneurons right here are what connect the two pieces in my spinal cord. And then my motor or efferent neurons are the ones that are getting and sending the signal out. So depending on what kind of neuron I'm talking about, it might be sending a signal in, might be sending a signal out, and there's differences between them. All right. And then lastly, right, is our three structural classifications of our neurons. So we have our multipolar neuron, right, which is probably the main one that we see in the body. The bipolar neuron, much more rare, just in like the nose and the eye. And then the unipolar neuron, which are found on all of our sensory um, nerves coming in. This guy right here, notice how close this shape and this shape look to each other. This is my set, the blue one at least, that's my sensory unipolar neuron, right? And then that multipolar neuron is that green or red one on this picture. Oops. 
So our three types is motor, bipolar, and unipolar. All right, that fills out page nine for you. Look at us, we are rocking and rolling. Flipping over here to page 10, we have already discussed, okay, action potential and all the pieces of this. Just remember an action potential is a nerve impulse. Same thing, okay, it's just a different word for it. Um, don't feel like you need to memorize all of this. Your review assignment will pretty much go over what you need to know. But the myelin sheath is what allows the um, speed of conduction, right? The speed, it speeds it up because of that myelin. That's important. Um, when a membrane is polarized, as in having two poles, positive and negative, it just means my outside is positive, my inside is negative, okay? Um, that's the main thing to know there. And then it goes through these steps, okay? I don't believe there's a question asking you to know the steps and putting them in order, right, on your test. All right, we also have this guy already filled out for you. We went over this recently, right, um, our parts of our central nervous system and spinal cord um, and brain and those structures. Um, yeah, I think I have said everything I need to say about that. And then we're getting to the end, you guys. Um, on page 11, this one we haven't filled out. We just labeled the diagram on this bad boy. And so we'll go over here it again. Oops, I'm covering it up. I feel like I have to keep moving, you guys. So, um, our nerves in our peripheral nervous system, this is the most you need to know about our peripheral nervous system. They are wrapped up right, in three layers, much like our muscles were. So the innermost is endoneurium. It covers a single axon. Perineurium makes a bundle of these axons and we call them a fascicle. And then finally the epineurium, the third layer is what forms a nerve and then blood vessels in there nourishing all those axons. Of our nerves, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves okay, that make up our um, nervous system. So the brain and spinal cord, not a part of the peripheral nervous system, but all the stuff in yellow is a part of it. So our cranial nerves are right here, right, coming, and you can see most of them are affecting the face. Right? That's why they're cranial nerves, they're in the head. And then the peripheral um nerves are all coming off of my spinal cord, going to my arms, my abdomen, and my legs. Okay, so we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 31 pairs of peripheral. You don't have to memorize that. For the sake of time, I did not have you guys memorize the 12 cranial nerves, but I want to talk to you about them. This is not on the test, okay? but I want to talk to you about them very briefly. Normally, I have in our class we memorize these nerves. You will probably have to memorize them if you take anatomy in college later on. And there's pairs, every there's 12 of them, and they number them Roman numeral, and they've got some crazy names, okay? The olfactory nerve, the optic nerve, the ocular motor nerve, trochlear, trigeminal, inducens, the facial, vestibular, cochlear, glossal, pharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal, and they're numbered one through 12, Roman numeral one through 12. And if you ever have to memorize these, you usually have to learn their functions too, and what job they have. And there's a memory trick for you. And I wanna tell you this, so if you have to do it in the future, I'll have at least given you this. So you can study that picture, but it's kind of hard to memorize. So one first thing is a good, um, acronym to help you remember these letters in order. I'll tell you mine super fast. You won't remember this for years to come, I know, but is for these O's here. Okay, we have three O's, on occasion, hour, and then two T's, trusty truck, acts funny, very good vehicle, anyhow. This one's different, they call it acoustic, um, but vestibular cochlear is usually the name that's given here. So on occasion, our trusty truck acts funny, very good vehicle. Anyhow, if you, you won't remember that, just Google it when you're in college and you're like acronym for the uh, cranial nerves. Um, and that helps you remember the numbers in order. Now to remember their functions, that's trickier. 
Okay, some of them have it in the name, like optic deals with the eye. Well, guess what? This weird drawing here is trying to show you someone's face. And they have put these Roman numerals on the face so that you can associate that nerve with what its job is on the face. So for example, the optic nerve number two, okay, controls like what I see, the vision, the sensory information coming in from my eye. The ocular motor nerve is number three, you notice how it's right here. That's the one that controls my little muscles on my eyeball that move my eye up and down. When I say look up, look down, left, right, those ocular motor nerves are controlling my eye movements. Olfactory number one is smell. So they have it here where the um, nose belongs. Um, so like try, uh, the trochlear kind of has a bunch of functions here with some of the like facial expressions and things like that. So they kind of have it there. Eight, okay, acoustic, um, which is oftentimes called vestibular cochlear because of cochlear implants. That one is here at eight for the ears uh, to represent the ears and hearing. Uh, so we've got 12 here, that's the tongue, hypoglossal, um, five, right, is my mouth and swallowing and pharynx, 11 is my neck, okay, um, the accessory ones here kind of down on the neck. So anyways, this picture is out there online. Just look it up, like memory helper for the cranial nerves. This will help you memorize them. You don't have to know any of this for the test. I just wanted to make sure you got this information somewhere, somehow from me, okay? All you need to know is that there are cranial nerves and peripheral nerves. They are both part of your peripheral nervous system. That's it, okay? Cranial nerves are not part of your central nervous system. They're part of the peripheral. That's all, that's all you need to know. All right, and then um, the ANS, PNS and ANS sound pretty dirty when you say them fast. <laughs> um, it stands for the autonomic nervous system, all those automatic things. And so, as we've already mentioned, our parasympathetic, rest and digest, and our sympathetic division, fight or flight, um, is what the autonomic nervous system is. We're not going to get into the details about what happens during those two phases because sake of time. All right, the very, very, very last thing I think that you guys have in your notes, if you wrote it down, is I encouraged you underneath in that blank space um, on page 11 to list out the steps of the action potential. You don't need to have this memorized for the test, okay? Um, I just want you to know when it's polarized, it's at rest. That's pretty much it, okay? Um, so don't worry about memorizing that for the test. I think it's the hardest part of it. And um, I'm just asking you guys to know like the itty bitty bare minimum. All right. I believe that wraps it up for our review. Your entire packet should be done and filled out. All of your homework assignments should be done and completed. I have already given you every single answer to the test on every single homework assignment. So you just have to make sure and be comfortable with that material. Some students like to redo all of the homework assignments in preparation. You don't have to do that, but definitely, 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 definitely do the review because that guarantees, I think there's 25, 26 questions. Every single one of those guys for sure is on the test. All right. I'll be back with a fast concept review tomorrow. Good luck. Um, remember, it is a time test. You have to access through your email. Message me if you have any questions, concerns, comments, whatever. I'm here for you. Uh, I hope you have a great day. Bye.